Every year, in consultation with the faculty, the seniors choose a speaker to represent their class in a commencement address. This year's speaker, Miguel Fiendero of San Jose, California, came to WCC from Bellarmine College Preparatory, and he distinguished himself early on for his academic excellence and his strong presence. Miguel wants to pursue a career in medicine, and I am convinced that in his first year or two, he was doing experiments on the capacity of the human body to sustain injuries with impunity. <laughs> experiments on himself. Why does Miguel have that bandage around his head, I would ask? Or why is Miguel's shoulder in a, in a sling? Or why is Miguel on crutches? These things never fazed him. He was unfailingly cheerful. In fact, each injury seemed to make him more confident. Like Odysseus with his scar, he now has good stories to tell, and perhaps we'll hear some this morning. Back in February, before everything closed down, Miguel distinguished himself in his senior oration, and along with his classmates Catherine Stipa and Emma Roberts, he presented his oration a second time to the Board of Directors at our meeting in Denver. Please welcome this morning, Mr. Miguel Fiendero. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Arbery, for that wonderful introduction. Chairman Kellogg, President Arbery, <coughs> Dean Washett, friends and family of WCC, and most importantly, class of 2020. Precisely 71 days ago, we gathered in Holy Rosary Church, where we were told that the coronavirus was not a significant threat. Barely more of a danger than the seasonal flu, life would go on as normal, with just a few precautions in place. Precisely 70 days ago, we were told that classes were canceled, outdoor trips were postponed, and we were headed home. 68 days ago, we spread across the nation, and by no fault of its own, a school premised on a no-technology policy, an outdoor curriculum, and a tight community was now isolated at home, and using only technology to communicate. <laughs> While we may never forget the great times we had smashing the refresh button as we tried to keep up with our popoli discussions, <laughs> or the soft sounds of siblings crying in the background of our Zoom classes, these times were just a small portion of our WCC experience. And so for once, let's put the coronavirus aside and talk about something else. Let's go back to the very beginning. Four years ago, we stumbled into the backcountry. We spent the next 21 days climbing mountains and singing so loud and obnoxiously, we could have slept in a bear den without noticing. <laughs> we watched meteorites and lightning light up the sky. We cooked the best of meals, and we cooked the worst of meals. <laughs> And who could forget that we met a park ranger by the name of Priscilla? <laughs> when we emerged 21 days later, like the Israelites longing for the onions and flesh pots of Lander, we emerged no longer stumbling about, but with a goal. No longer with strangers, but with friends. But this was just the beginning. Fresh out of the backcountry, we found ourselves in Dr. Boland's Philosophy 101 class. Young and bright-eyed, we began our search for the answers to the eternal questions. It was here that we picked up the logical tools and the philosophical first premises that would guide us over the next four years. But among the sea of Aristotelian distinctions and Platonic forms, there was one moment that stood out in particular. Early on in the semester, at the end of one of our classes, the conversation lulled, and as usual, we turned to Dr. Boland for inspiration. We didn't know it yet, 
but we were in for the first of many functional human being talks. These functional human being talks, which later progressed into grumpy monologues, <laughs> self-proclaimed, by the way, <laughs> gave us a time to step back from the nuanced texts that we were reading and talk about the broader implication and importance of philosophy. From topics such as cognition bias to friendship to smoking, these talks provided some great insights over our four years. But this one stood out in particular. So there he was, perched upon the table, both legs swinging, with the head ever so slightly tilted, and a very slight but mischievous grin. And then came the words, and I paraphrase. The thing that differentiates the liberal arts education from your standard four-year education is that the liberal arts education is absolutely useless. My heart stopped. <laughs> Why is this man so happy about that? I, I just spent the last four months of my life trying to convince my family and friends that that wasn't the case. So, for the family and friends back home, I better do the same now. Uh, what Dr. Bolin went on to say was that the liberal arts is useless because it is not done for something else. You don't do the liberal arts to own a Lamborghini or for the glory or for the fame or for the nice house. You do it because it is beautiful and good in itself. It's useless in the way that watching the sunrise is useless, or spending time with family or friends is useless. It's useless because you're not doing it for anything else. This was a beautiful claim. Some might say an absolutely massive claim. <laughs> But only the next few years would prove it. And they turned out to be a journey. We rapidly moved from criticizing everyone who wasn't St. Thomas <laughs> to being able to enter into an academic friendship with some of the greatest minds of the Western tradition. In reading authors like Machiavelli, Locke, or Aristotle, it was never about what some Italian or Greek thought hundreds or thousands of years ago. It was about the insights that they provided that are just as true today as they were back then. It is learning about the ideas that they came up with and how they formulated society and how those ideas continue to form who we are, whether or not we know it. In a way, we grew ever closer to fulfilling the Delphic injunction to know thyself. And at times, the journey could not have been sweeter. The moments of insight in class, the late nights around the campfire, the early mornings in Sinks Canyon when you'd beat the sun up the slopes for an early morning run. The practicums, the dances, the dorm life. But there were times when the road was also long and rocky. When the pain of being dragged out of the cave was palpable. When the answers simply didn't add up. But these times too were necessary. Because it was never about the easy answers. If it was then we probably did waste four years because Google and Sparknotes already exists. What it was about was experiencing the beauty of God's creation firsthand rather than through a postcard. About finding one's place in salvation history rather than just listening to the rules that the catechism sets out for you. About being able to pick up a poem and read it and understand it without having to have Sparknotes or someone else tell you what it means. And at times, the journey seemed like it would never end. But now it has come to a close. And one question remains. What now? We've been given this gift. But what are we to do with it? Was it four years of studying the good, true, and beautiful, simply to forget about that as we go on to become lawyers, doctors, fathers, mothers, teachers, whatever we go on to become? Surely not. Rather, as Dr. Boland so beautifully put it, since the liberal arts is done for itself, whatever we were wounded by in terms of beauty, if you were wounded by the beauty of the outdoors, or of philosophy, or of theology, then we will continue to study these after we leave WCC. Taking the habits we have formed here, if the questions were ever worth pursuing before WCC, or at WCC, they will continue to be worth pursuing after we leave this place. 
And yet to say that these four years were simply the beginning of a journey would fail to acknowledge the distinctiveness of our time at WCC. All the four years that we had the opportunity to do nothing other than pursue the good, true, and beautiful. And so this is where I turn to the Brothers Karamazov for some aid. In the Brothers Karamazov, Father Zosima imparts a distinctive teaching on memories. Memories are not just images of the past, something you look at and remember the good old days. But they are eternally present to us, eternally ready to be drawn upon for inspiration, for insight and motivation, eternally forming who we are. And so our memories of WCC and of the books that we have read here will always be with us and always present to us. And that is for the better. Because when we leave this place, we're entering a world which never valued isolation more. A world that hungers for meaning, for purpose, for a cause to fight for, for a friend to lean on, for a reason to live. A reason where the best, a world where the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. A world that is too much with us. A world where profit is king and virtue is weakness. But far more important than any of that, we are leading into a world that is charged with the grandeur of God. And we have been given four years to be a witness to that fact. And now it is our job to continue to witness that fact after we leave college. And so when we leave this refuge of WCC, we will take these memories, these habits of learning, this pursuit for the good and the beautiful, and bring it with us to do whatever we go on to do. And so to end with the words of T.S. Eliot, Fair forward, travelers, not escaping from the past into indifferent lives or into any future. You are not the same people who left that station or the same who will arrive at any terminus. While the narrowing rails slide together behind you and on the deck of the drumming liner, watching the furrow that widens behind you, you shall not think the past is finished or the future is before us. And so, class of 2020, when we leave this place, it is not fare thee well, but fare thee forward. Thank you.